Uh, Ken Fisher here, prolific writer, along with Laura Hoffman's. There's the book. Let's bring it up. Debunkery. Learn it, do it, and profit from it. We get in 47 books every day. This is wonderfully thin, 218 pages. It, it reads like a 19th century novel. Way too, many. Way too many. Way too many pages. And, no, no, not at all. 50 chapters. Terrorism. Terrorizes stocks. What do you want to accomplish here? What's the goal? Basically... Most people, when they make active decisions in capital markets, are wrong more than they're right. And if you can reduce your error rate, you end up being better off. So there's simple things you can learn to do to test to see if, are these things that I think are true really false? And if they are, you shouldn't do them. So debunkery is really about learning the process of testing to see if something you think is even possibly true, which Card often right. isn't. Cardinal rule. Everybody focuses on what to do right, and you're saying stop doing dumb things. If you can reduce your error rate, you improve your success. It's a real simple process. What's wrong with buy and hold? Here it is, the Dow Jones, nine decades. Okay, moldy, moldy over there on the right side of the chart, financial-based maybe. But that's a pretty good track record to just pick up 1,000 shares and hold it forever. You don't agree? Uh, first... I'm not a big fan of the Dow because it's a price weighted index. I just index. use the Dow because it's a long time series. But I hate the Dow because it's a price weighted index. And they can't, one of the, they one can't of the things, have Apple in, can they? Because it messes up the Dow so much. The Dow is a funny index. It's a price weighted index. Uh, high price stocks have more power in price weighted indexes right. than low price stocks. Um, but more importantly, the only thing that really matters is what's shortly ahead of us. There's nothing I can do today about the year 2020. All I can do is focus on 2011 and maybe begin to focus on 2012. That's about as much as you can do. They have no 20-year futures. And th therefore, we need to be, in my mind, what's kind of inside the fretting zone. Right. And, well, I like that, the fretting and, and, zone. And, 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 and right. the fretting zone is basically sort of 30 days from now to 30 months from now. I love this in the book. I picked it out right away. Folks, this is really important. Stop losses are abused. I can't begin to tell you. Stop losses don't work because stock prices aren't serially correlated. That means price movements by themselves don't predict future price movements. Tattoo that phrase to your brain. What happened yesterday doesn't have a lick of impact on what happens today or tomorrow, and yet pros, I rarely see stop losses unless it's a real short-term strategy and it's 3.42 p.m. And amateurs, I see stop losses galore. Continue. The, the fact is, because stocks are not uh, autocorrelated, there is no notion that if, let's say, the market drops by X percent, then you get out and you win by that. In fact, all of history shows that that doesn't actually stop losses. What it does is stops gains because it takes you out. And then the other part about stop loss strategies is they never have a how do you get back in rule. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is we should always be forward looking. And if let's say your stop loss was at 15 percent, when you're down, you still want to be forward looking. Okay. You always want to be forward looking. We're going to go to break, come back quickly. Um, how do you know when to sell a stock then? It's the toughest thing to do. It's I agree. really hard. Yeah. What you have to do is say, what did I do that was wrong? And what do I see moving forward now that makes me right? That's a really tough thing for the brain to do. I agree. Ken Fisher with us. We're going to do more of this. We're going to come back. Two more ideas from Debunkery. It's a wonderful book. Short, short chapters. I love that. Ken Fisher uh, here with us. The book is Debunkery, 182 pages, wonderfully short 50 chapters. I want to get right to bonds. Let's buy bonds. Bill Gross says buy equities. Margie Patel says buy equities. You've always said buy equities. Here's a quote on bonds that I love so much. Stocks are more consistently positive than bonds given just a bit of time. Therefore, over the longer term, stocks have been less risky. Stocks are safer than bonds. Sure looks that way. And many people are at home going, yeah, right. Look what it did to me in 08. So one of the points that I make in, in debunkery is that if you just look at the long-term history, and this is not only true in America, this is true throughout developed nations, if you just extend time horizons a little and think of volatility over longer time periods, stocks end up being lower risk than bonds are. That is, if you have a three-year or yeah, longer three time years. horizon, right. and most people do have a fairly long time horizon, longer than they think, 
volatility in those longer time periods is actually lower for stocks than it is for bonds. If you actually just take the short term, stocks are definitely riskier. No question about it. If we think of next month, the likelihood is stocks are riskier than bonds are. If we think of 10 years, mm -hmm. stocks are almost always less risky than bonds. Another idea, boomers, bring L it up here. Lower volatility. Yeah, lower volatility, better sharp ratio, et cetera. On trainer, Jensen, all those ratios that uh, don't matter when the markets are down 165 points. Stop fearing the boomers. It sounds like a Uriah, not Uriah Heap. I can't remember the band that had that that song. Anyway, stop fearing the boomers. Maybe the selling boomers sells to a few young Brazilian or Peruvian up-and-comers. GDP is growing there at twice the U.S. rates. The boomers are going to retire. The world ends. Uh, well, the world does end, but it doesn't happen quickly. And uh, secondarily, the boomers are very wealthy on average, wealthier than their parents, and they're in a better position to retire than we think they are. But the real issue is not the boomers, the real issue is emerging markets, which collectively has more GDP than America does and is growing at a rapid rate. And for the rest of our lives, I can guarantee you that the U.S. economy will not go a different direction than mm -hmm. the rest of the world. We may lead, we may lag, but we're going the same yeah. direction. Yeah, and chart one brings us right into it. Bring it up here. It's an elegant chart. The U.S. is an emerging market. The white line, the S&P 500. Uh, Brazil struggling recently in the short term, I would suggest. You still have your faith in the emerging markets that we see in Forbes? Not in the stock market in the short term. Uh, there's too much optimism in the short term. The economies in the long term, but emerging markets are like every other category. There's a time to get into them. There's a time to avoid them. And right now, there's too much optimism in the so short term. So then do you go to the United markets. States? Yes. Right now, the U.S. is the place to lead. Small cap the or stock. large cap? Um, upper middle cap. Okay. Uh, the middle of the market. Uh, just, just, if you just, there's too much pessimism about America. And if you just aim straight at the middle of America, mm. America is doing better than people think it is. Defend, passive or active? I, I'm, I'm neutral on that subject. The fact is, most people, when they make investment decisions, are wrong. 85% of professional investors lag the market. 15% mm -hmm. beat the market. The fact is, you have to know something other people don't know to justify making an active decision. And therefore, for most people, if you don't believe you know something other people don't know, you're better off being passive. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Ken Fisher, thank you so much. This book is outstanding. Debunkery, short, really focused. Read it with a pencil.